Everyone, can you hear me? All right. So uh, yesterday in his opening remarks, Ed Free said the things that really matter are the most difficult to predict, and this panel is going to make some predictions for us today. So good luck. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about the future of augmented reality, and we have a panel here, people who work in the field. So let's go r down the line just quickly. Everyone, please introduce yourselves. I'm Brian Mullins. I'm the founder and CEO of Daiquiri. I'm Tony Gaidadzis, CEO, uh, CTO of Personal Neuro. Hi, everyone. I'm Connor Russomano. I'm co-founder and CEO of OpenBCI. Hi, I'm Tish Shute, and I'm co-founder of Augmented World Expo and on the founding team of Syntertainment. Hi, I'm Rick Johnson. I'm the co-founder at Technical Illusions. And I'm Eric Johnson. I cover gaming for Recode. So uh, to get started, we've been hearing a lot about augmented reality for a number of years now. And so I just wanted to maybe go down the line, just have everyone sort of explain what's changed over the years. What, what are your various uh, companies and, and projects doing right now that's sort of may, maybe different from what we've seen and heard about augmented reality previously? Sure, you know, I'll start. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting is how much uh, augmented reality has expanded. You know, what we're doing, um, you, you often see in the news around uh, media and advertising campaigns, and, and now hopefully more around gaming. But what's been really interesting at Daiquiri over the last four years is, is how much we've grown in the industrial space, uh, where you're doing real-time knowledge transfer uh, on the factory floor and, and in construction environments, where, where you're doing some you know, really valuable knowledge transfer and, and teaching people things, complex, multi-step processes in, in a way that they could never do before, and, and bridging language gaps as well, because it's all a, a really visual medium. So I work with uh, mood, mood analysis, basically. We can determine like your level of stress and your level of relaxation, um, your anxiety, depression, things like that, which has interesting implications for, uh, I think, health and wellness and gaming. Um, so an example might be, you know, if you, if you need to an analyze something, let's say through a Daiquiri product, and we can kind of sense how, how a person is interpreting that at, a, at an emotional level, kind of. And, um, relay that information back to the user or, uh, or back to somebody who needs to know. Uh, so, yeah, I'm by no means an expert at augmented reality. My, my, I guess my contribution to this conversation is coming from kind of the, the biometric sensing standpoint, and I'm, I'm really just fascinated. OpenBCI is very new. We were recently, uh, back in January, funded on Kickstarter, and so I'm really interested in exploring and discussing kind of how biometric sensors are going to influence uh, the future of of the, the immersive experience and how that applies to augmented reality. So, um, yes, I we founded uh, Augmented World Expo five years ago on the premise that we all thought there would be lots of eyewear to play with in five years, and I think there's quite a lot of wonderful eyewear to play with. Um, but the the thing that I think emerged in the five years that we weren't as clear on is that this isn't about just the hardware, the, this is about a, a kind of progression from the internet of content, the internet of people, the internet of things, the internet of the body, and if we, I loved the phrase Tim Chang uh, brought up yesterday, the tech-enabled soul, the internet of the soul. So this is, this is about something much bigger, and I think it's putting those pieces together is the place we're at now, and this conference is part of that. So we're creating a product called Cast AR. It's a, a set of glasses that create a stereoscopic display that does both uh, AR as well as VR. And while our primary focus is AR, I think the technology that you're seeing develop in all these conferences is coming to fruition recently because of the price reduction of all these components. We're adding a ton of advanced technology to these glasses, but it's all because they're now becoming very cheap, mostly to, due to, to the cell phone market that all these technologies are now becoming mass produced, which is driving the cost down. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting point in terms of the, the lowering cost over the years here. And it raises the question of consumer uh, applications of AR versus uh, sort of more specialized focuses like academic, health, uh, research, uh, education. Um, where do you see, this is for, for, for anyone here, um, do you see the potential of AR being realized sooner in one of those more specialized fields, or do you see that we're kind of, or do you think that we're on the verge of something of a big sort of consumer uptick and, and, and uh, embrace of VR of, of AR? I think you're going to see it in the consumer market <clears throat> because uh, a lot of big institutions, like research institutions, tend to move very slowly and they want to make sure that their steps are very well calculated. Um, but the consumer market. 
people seem to be more willing to try things out. Kickstarter is a great example of just like, well, let's see what we can do with this. And kind of people are willing to grow with the technology because it's new to them and it's new to the people producing it. Whereas I think that um, in like with medicine, they're trying to make things that are as good or better than existing technologies with, with this new hardware and new software. I think for us, when we first started to create the technology for our glasses, we had to do a lot of basic learning of what the AR space was. Uh, how does the user interact? What type of visuals are compelling? What works? What doesn't work? And I think you'll find that with this space, there's going to be a, a long kind of learning curve of what truly can be done that uh, once people realize that you can take something simple and turn it into magical or something simple and turn it into a new way of understanding or approaching. Uh, to give you an example, people that are going through rehabilitation for strokes often are trying to do very simple tasks of moving an object from one spot to another or just simply grasping it. Part of the frustration with rehabilitation is they just can't control their motor skills that well and they become very frustrated with the whole process. For an application like AR, suddenly they can interact in a virtual world where you can adjust the rules, that physics doesn't have to be as real or as unforgiving. And if you can overcome a simple concept of frustration, you can now turn this simple idea to rehabilitation to something that might become much more easier and long lasting for these patients. I think it's also important to realize how much of the specialty applications are, are actually being done today. I think, I think augmented reality really has arrived but it's, it's arrived in these specialty segments that, that maybe the public doesn't see as much. I mean, the technology's already being used today to manufacture ships, you know, a, a really high value construction project that you've got to get right the first time. And, and so the, the, the cost benefit has been there for several years and they've made some great strides forward. And, and hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent every year on augmented reality and those types of applications. I think the technology and specifically, you know, mobile phones and, and all the mobile technology that's, that's going now into new form factors like wearables uh, is setting the bar higher for the content so that, that we can now get out to the consumers and, and have something where you're really connected to content that's beautiful and, and seamless and, and you can have these experiences everywhere. So, so the, the, the niche applications have, are already happening. They're happening every day. People use augmented reality for their job every day. And, and now it's finally getting to the point where it's gonna get out to the consumer and, and have some really meaningful experiences. Oh, I mean, just to add to Brian, I, I, I'm going to put a little other extra bit on that, that I agree the niche applications are there and most of the high-end hardware experiences, the gorgeous headsets are all in that and the kind of business model is subscription model. But I've always been a big advocate for what I call poor man's AR and, and that's what Dennis Crowley used to call Foursquare back in the day, even when it was actually Pac Manhattan, I think he described as poor man's AR. And that kind of you know connectivity when we you know eric eric free said yesterday at microsoft research the one thing they missed was the moment when computers all over the world would spontaneously connect to the network and that's the moment that's you know not it hasn't happened but is very imminent and that's when these kind of new experiences you know do spontaneously connect to a network all over the years. And some of that is still research, but if you look at poor man's AR and you look at where Foursquare's going, I mean, to me, that's as much AR as anything else if you don't take the hardware out of it. That's actually a perfect segue into my next question, which is the devices on which augmented reality works best. Um, I remember you know, years ago playing a game where it was sort of a, an augmented reality game where I was, uh, it was like a, a Star Wars uh, gunner game where you're shoot, shooting uh, spaceships while spinning around in an office chair. And I'm, you know, that, that's something in the consumer world that, that was a, a kind of fun application, a fun use of, of AR. But do you see, do you, uh, again, for anyone, do you see the uh, arrival of wearables either you know, in, in, in any form? Do you see that as being as offering more potential for AR? I mean, is the fact is does the does having the screen kind of you know persistently above your face does that make it easier to develop content for for, for these devices to, to make it kind of more seamless? I wouldn't say it makes it easier to develop content, but I would say that it's it's fully immersive. So um, the potential for just a completely groundbreaking way of seeing the world is there. But I think that that makes content delivery 
uh, a, a unique challenge because you don't want to be inundated with information. So uh, figuring out what, what the thresholds are for how much information a person can process, how much they, can, uh, they need to interact with the real world versus the virtual world, how, how many hints are still hints and useful, it, that's the stuff I think we're going to have a lot of trouble with. I think, I think very quickly to your point about that, a lot of aesthetics will emerge for augmented reality with, with this immersive uh, wearable displays, uh, much like with apps. You know, we can all point out an ugly app now. Uh, but five years ago, nobody knew what an ugly app was. We just kind of figured it out on which ones were easier to use, which ones were pleasing. And, and I think the level of immersion and the level of augmentation will, will become that new aesthetic. One of the um, things that we've kind of discovered is games that are involving both the, the virtual, the AR experiences, as well as the physical environment. We had a, a two-player game where people would interact in the same physical space. And now you kind of have this pushing and shoving that's adding a unique element that you haven't seen uh, in ways for games to develop. And I think exploring these new input mechanisms and how people interact, uh, because AR is truly about being able to see the physical world, about seeing each other, and taking that to, uh, and I'll hate this phrase, but the next level, and finding how to adapt and change the understanding and the foundation of games uh, going forward is going to be really neat. Um, yes, just, I, I mean, I kind of really agree with that because the history of AR is deeply rooted in the idea of, you know, visual primacy because we're, as human beings, visual is very primary. Um, but I think it is, it, we've come to understand that it's much more about the six senses or however many senses you want to have um, coming together. But the, the visual is at the minute still separate, I think, from some of the sort of ideas of you know the quantified self movement and stuff and when this st starts together that comes together that's where it's really interesting because the visual really helps us narrativize things we're human beings that's how we think and that was i tried muse yesterday and the thing that stuck out in my mind was the comment said be careful of self-criticizing thoughts so the internal narrative was absolutely key to the way you know, Muse was working for you. And that's when you bring that together with all of the sensing, OMG, yeah. Yeah, I guess if I could jump in there, that, you know, I, I think I come at this from kind of a unique perspective. Um, I've been listening, trying to get the lay of the land a little bit, but the- Time to pounce, go. So, yeah, yeah. So anyway, the, the, um, I think that it's gonna be fascinating as this wearable kind of revolution continues and these biometric you know, EEG sensors or EMG sensors get embedded into these devices. We're gonna have this, um, you know, the, all, all of our interconnectivity and this kind of latency from person to person and from in, internal to experiential is gonna be decreased. And so what I think you're gonna see is kind of this like, um, this central nervous system being extended in a way from person to person in a way that we really haven't thought of before. I know, you know, like the internet was kind of a really great example of this was when all of a sudden we became nodes of a larger system. And I think augmented reality is gonna be this kind of, um, this gap that, or this tool that um, decreases the latency between these nodes and adds a more seamless kind of interaction from internal to the experiential and also from person to person, so. I, I think it's a great point, great, great time to, to jump in. You came up to speed quickly. Because you know, what you're getting at is, is essentially, you know, there, there's two things we're talking about here. We're talking about augmented reality technologies. You know, Tish makes a good point. You know, something like Foursquare, knowing where you're at, that's a type of augmented reality technology. But, but we're also talking about a medium that all these technologies are creating. And, and that medium is about manifesting ideas. So you take the understanding of where you're at. You, you take your understanding of what the camera sees. You take the increased understanding of the brain based on, on the progress in neurotech. And, and now that lets you create a medium of ideas in that context. You know, and, and so you take all these people that are connected together by the internet today, and you've got to look into some kind of box to see your ideas manifest. You gotta see, you know, look in your phone, look in your computer, and we're talking about just take, take everything out of the box and let's just put it all in the real world and let's manifest those ideas here and reduce the latency, reduce the friction, 
and, and hopefully, the, and one of the reasons that, that we're so excited about Neurotech at Daiquiri is, is as a UI, let's, let's go directly to the thoughts and, and manifest them today in a simple way and, and down the road. You know, I think it's pretty clear that, that, that the future is, is bright for Neurotech. Yeah, everyone else, like, what, what sort of, what uh, signals are you looking for either in terms of neuroscience, in terms of biofeedback? What, what are you seeing here, here at this conference in terms of what can be applied to, to your own work on augmented reality? Sure. I mean, I think right now with especially the commercial devices, which I think most people are interested in applying, like, right off the bat, as we were talking about this, like, com the commercial applications is um, engagement and alertness. So these are some of the easier signals to detect with lower channel counts. And I think that's the most realistic thing that's going to be applied to augmented reality off the bat. Um, so what I think you'll see is, uh, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if this emerges in the next year or two, is you know, Google Glass with an electrode that's, that's tracking engagement and some type of external vision on the sensor that's looking at where you're looking in the world relative to where your eye is looking. So it's doing eye tracking and, and basically matching your engagement to the world around you. And I think, you know, there are a lot of ethical things to consider here about um, being able to track literally what someone's looking at and how interested they are in it. Um, but I think it, that definitely is something that should be considered in the future of augmented reality, like in the development of these technologies. Is, I mean, I think we should touch on this later, but just all of the ethical considerations of our evolution with technology within the context of augmented reality. Uh, yeah, the, the ethical issues are, will be very interesting. Um, for me, I think it's it's um, very exciting to see how optimistic people are and how um, benevolent people are generally and in terms of their how they want to see the technology applied. They want to see people, you know, having greater engagement, having uh, living happier and more rewarding lives, and just being more relaxed and and enjoying the moment that they're in, which I think is a really wonderful way to go about things. I haven't seen anyone be like, oh yeah, we have to use the technology to control people or anything like that. So. That's, I think it bodes well for the future. Um, yes, I think if you take a, a simple old-time definition of AR, it's about who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. We're pretty much you know, there with the where you are and what you're doing. Got pretty good stuff on that. But, and this is why I find this conference so exciting. It's the who you are, and it's the definition of who that's incredibly interesting. And, and I sort of, you know, I think in stages we have sort of you know, Internet of Things, Internet of Body, but I think it's this understanding of this who, and that we are not just visual beings, we are sensory beings, and I mean, these debates about mind in Western philosophy go back forever, but we are, re this, this is turning this all around, and it is about what mind is, what person is, what identity is, and it's kind of mind-blowing when you think of it like that, and I think there's lots of to be practical. The moment we're at now is try and think of how we can learn more about this who by connecting up a little bit out of our comfort zone on these senses. You know, not, you know, what is the where when it's connected to some of the other sensing? You know, what is that? What does that change? How does that change the who? And you could be quite practical about that. There's a lot of startups in that concept right now that could get traction. So I don't think, I've never felt this is far off. I mean, I used the term AR, well, same time Dennis did when he was first doing Pac-Man, Pac-Man Hatton. <laughs> uh, for gaming, if you think about it, like if all of us play a game right now, we get the same experience, the same script. But if the game can actually understand what makes us scared, imagine the experience you can get now if the game dynamically adapts and is able to adapt and realize our our fears what makes us happy and the the experience that we'll get out of that game will be like nothing ever before if you turn that into a movie experience and if a, have an audience watching a movie and if the uh, the bad guy of the scene can understand who fears him the most in the audience he can actually call out that specific individual and make it very a targeted experience and so taking all these neural things and making it into a dynamic world is just going to change everything and how we've ever seen these kind of scripts uh, coming to this point. It's so true. I mean, think about what he just said. You're talking about taking a story and giving it the sense of proprioception. Like that's, 
you know, I, I don't know if everybody knows what proprioception is, probably a high percentage in this crowd. Go ahead but, and explain it anyway. <laughs> okay, so it's, you know, everybody says we've got five senses and that's kind of a joke. It's, uh, there's probably more like 14 if you consider that um, the, one of them is pro proprioception. It's, it's where your limbs are at. You don't have to look to know where they're at. You actually have dedicated cells to tell you where it's at. So you can walk upstairs without tripping. And, and that's important because you can walk on a flat surface, you can walk upstairs, and now you're talking about giving a story proprioception, and if there's stairs, it can play out on the stairs, and the character can walk down the stairs and interact with you in your environment. And, and then the story can unfold in completely new ways. Um, there's, a, there's a great drama in New York called Sleep No More that they play Shakespeare in, in a um, warehouse. And in all the different rooms, you can follow the characters around and, and gravitate towards what you're interested in and see a completely different story than someone else might see. And we're talking about making that same effect with any story that we tell, any digital storytelling, um, any feature film, could be completely personalized to me because in that scene, I was more interested in the bad guy and I followed him to the back room to see what he did next. And I didn't see the vanilla version of the hero you know, going through his montage. I, I saw something else that was you know, a tearjerker and, and it really was compelling to me. And, and I think that that's, that's gonna change storytelling completely. And, and the way we experience entertainment. I'd like to jump in there just because this is pretty relevant. Um, you don't need to ask permission every time. Yeah, no, <laughs> sure. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> You've already proved you have so good yeah, ideas. The, uh, the, the, I'm glad you, you brought up Sleep No More. That's an awesome. I think you guys should all check it out if you're ever in New York. But um, so yeah, the, the idea of interactive narrative and being able to, uh, to tell a story or actually guide yourself through a story based on your, your actual biological reaction to the experiences. And so my thesis actually was involved in this. It was a neuroimmersive graphic novel that took you through various plot lines based on your level of engagement with the story using a NeuroSky device. Um, and I just, you know, there's a lot of ways that that type of system can be um, basically changed and augmented to provide the user with kind of subtle and elegant feedback that's not, the, the trick in, in that type of design is, is not making it super obvious how your, your, your senses are affecting the story, but rather shaping the feedback to more subtly allow you to guide and navigate through your story or your experience in, in a, you know, kind of uh, just pleasant and non-invasive but more passive way. Um, Looks like you're, you want to jump in here? Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that um, because we live in a world where our, our brain doesn't really, all, like how we feel doesn't dramatically alter from our perception the world we live in in the same way that like, you know, picking up something with my hand, it's a dramatic difference in my reality if I can pick it up and move it over here versus like just thinking about it or being like in a bad mood or something. Although being in a, you know, being stressed or being upset or being happy or whatever changes how you interact with the world and how other people interact with you. And it's, it's a subtle difference, but it does exist and people are aware of it. And, so, and I think games that can find that line um, between, you know, the realism of how your mood and your, your engagement and everything affect the real world from your subjective experience and the fantasy of that, maybe giving you uh, extra powers, uh, maybe in, in a kind of a fantasy game, um, will be the ones that really are captivating. Because I think that if it goes overboard, and it's like, like a Jedi mind trick every time, then people kind of get used to that. And it just isn't, there isn't that, that sensitive realism that you can almost, you know, manipulate this thing, and that the story isn't tailored for you at that point. It's just, oh, you're lifting a thing. And Great. Oh, oh I sort of got a segue in that. You notice I always push out to networks, but um, I think that's a really important point. That right now, I mean, we understand our connectivity through things like the social graph, or you know, where you are, people nearby. But, I mean, I've certainly seen research on this, and maybe academics here know more about it than I, but, you know, the connectivity change, what about, you know, how, what about a spontaneous body network? What does that mean from your other senses, not just your social graph? And I think that's, you know, very, very interesting. It changes the way we think about each other, the way we think about what we have in common, the way we think about what we want to share, and, I mean, that's, I think we're actually at that point now that we really need to start thinking in this way. 
Yeah, that, that, that may be a good point to double back to the ethical question there, because right now when we talk a lot about ethics and technology, it's things that we know that we can share. It said, the phone says, can I share your location? I say, well, I'm at the Metreon. Sure, share my location. Whereas we're talking here about things we may not be consciously aware of with you, your heart rate, your, you know, what you're thinking, how you're feeling. Um, so how can people working in augmented reality without, without crippling their own efforts, like how should we approach the, those sorts of questions of what's appropriate to collect and, and to use um, here? I guess I'll start. I, I think an important point is to start conceiving of the network as a separate entity. We sort of have this, this human way of looking at the world where we go, oh, there's a person looking at my data, but, and I don't want to share my information with a person or with that person or with this person. I think that is a very important concept of privacy, but we also now have this, um, this entity that can, you know, the cloud with, with data processing and things, that can anonymously process our information as part of like a whole pool of resources and then tailor information back to us without actually knowing who we are in a real sense. And I think that the, separating those concepts between people looking at who I am and knowing who I am and where I'm going and what I'm doing and this entity that doesn't have really any agency in the way that a person does or any like um, judgment the way that a person does. Uh, I think that's, that'll be an important distinction. I think uh, I'd like to jump in. Um, the, what, what you're suggesting, and, and I agree with you, is that we're approaching this kind of event horizon of the technological evolution. Um, and we, you know, there's no denying that we are uh, so, um, kind of intertwined with the technology that we use on a daily basis. I, I, I would venture to guess that every single person in this room spends at least 50% of their daily life looking at a screen. Um, and so there's this like kind of just, we, there's no turning back really at this point. And we, we, we have this like kind of thing on the horizon, which is this very critical juncture where um, we have to look at it and it, it's, it's basically the decision where, you know, do we, you know, does technology, or, or do we become technology or does te technology become us? You know, and so, and I think that's gonna be an ongoing battle. You know, and I think that with the development of these technologies, with augmented reality, we have to continuously know that that's in the future and design for it and not ignore that. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of take a, a, a position a little on the other end of the spectrum, not that I disagree with this, but I think you're seeing this foreshadowed in the sharing economy and the battles that are going on around Airbnb, who comes up against like a, a completely, you know, like other system. And, and it's, I think it's the key is that it doesn't just, when you say this is gonna change who we are, it doesn't just change the individual, the social organization changes too. And I think the key to this is things that we're learning in these, if you watch the battles of the sharing economy, you'll see it's all about moving to, you know, self-organizing, distributed ways of working through these problems. And, you know, ultimately I think it's gonna take that. I think the, this is gonna, you know, for this to really work, this idea of a, say, a spontaneous body network, <laughs> which is probably the most out there thing I'm thinking about right now, um, is, is that, that this is, you know, and I'm actually watching the sharing economy because I find that super interesting because there's some of the, you know, this is, this is foreshadowing some of the things we have to think about. But I also agree with you, there's things to think about that are not just about, you know, the people, but this works quite differently. I think augmented reality's actually done a great service towards privacy by making us think about it. The truth is, the event horizon you talk about happened 10 years ago. You know, we're all seen by hundreds of cameras every day. Our data is all collected in databases and our, our life is defined, defined by credit scores that we don't even know the algorithm for. But augmented reality is making us think about, you know, where our data is and, and who's taking our picture and, and what kind of facial recognition it might be. You know, the idea that you could look at, at my face and see my credit score tied to it because of my ID on, on Facebook and, and, and online sources, um, it's scary, but people already tie your credit score to you and you don't know about it. 
I think it's really important that we're bringing these discussions to life and thinking about it. Um, I, I think it's, there's, there's another side of the coin where part of it's gonna be not a big deal. When, when cell phone cameras came out, if you took out your phone in a grocery store, the manager would chase you out the door. I mean, I know that sounds funny to, to people that um, just don't remember anything but smartphones, but if you pulled out your camera phone in a grocery store, the manager would get ticked off. And, and now the idea that you, know, you can't look for a better deal seems strange. Um, so to a certain extent, behavior will change, but I, I hope it doesn't change so much that we forget that we're already you know, being surveilled. We already have all this data collected about us, and, and it's really our responsibility to, to bring that to light for, to other people. And I think AR can help with that a little bit, hopefully. I think for me, it comes down to disclosure, that if I'm, I'm playing a game and it's sensing my biofeedback, sure, that's fine. If all of a sudden I'm browsing the internet and it senses I'm thirsty and I'm getting targeted ads for liquor or something like that, that's probably a line I don't want to cross. I don't want advertisers knowing that instant of how I'm feeling and that they're making money off of these kind of raw emotions that I have. And I think the more that we're upfront and honest to our end users of here's exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what it's for, that will help ease this kind of transition. And that's, that's a great point that you could take to the extreme, too. What, what, if, what if five years from now, the BCI technology is as good as we all hoped it would be? And you could put on you know, just a, a hair clip with an electrode and read your raw thought, right? And let's just pick on Google for a second, because they already do it with search. And they start marketing to you based on your thoughts. Like, how many people have, have thoughts that you don't want the world to know about? And you certainly don't want to be marketed about. Just because you know, the, the, the substance of our thought is is very random and hectic. It's made up of a whole di bunch of different voices that, that you turn into actual behavior that defines you. You don't necessarily want direct access to that thought. I think, I think the more interesting discussion around privacy is, you know, what do you do with all this data that's direct brain data? I mean, what, what if we could come up with an algorithm that could chug on EEG data and, and pull out the, the thoughts? Like how many people have done research with EEGs and just left that EEG data like unprotected from the last you know 20 years and and now you could go back and read all the thought from it I know from an entropic standpoint that's that's not really logical but but if it did you know now we've got all these thoughts just spread out that nobody thought to protect yeah I think that's uh, the idea of kind of dissecting a thought is a is actually one of those common misconceptions about EEG technology and you know, there, it is possible to kind of look at a general brain state, like alertness, and then infer attention. But the idea of actually like dissecting a specific thought is very difficult. You know, like that, that would require um, many electrodes planted from deep within the brain and, and sampling like, you know, tiny bundles of neurons. To, Abs absolutely. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I've seen some really fascinating uh, MRI studies. This, you know, understanding EEG is significantly different, but just from, from this year where you can extract faiths from, from thought. And, uh, you know, and from a content standpoint, that's interesting. You know, think of the scariest villain and then whatever facial features that you've got in your brain, let's extract them and throw them on the villain and make you even more scared. Um, but, but, you know, what if I've got people that I've been thinking about? Now, I don't have a thought, but that brain state could lead you to some valuable data about what I was thinking about at the time. Right. The, the, yeah, that's a good point. The, I think the more uh, kind of realistic scenario is being presented a lot of information and having one data point in that sample set be something that you can identify with and, and having that trigger or elicit a, a, a mental stimuli. So for instance, one kind of scary uh, ethical question here would be like using this for, uh, uh, I guess, uh, lie detection or um, you know, basically maybe taking an accused uh, villain and, and having them or, or scanning through a, a villain or a, a 20 samples of like murder scenes and then when the one that's the actual scene shows up, then the person who committed the murder is actually going to elicit a response. Whereas sure. like everyone else that's being sampled wouldn't. And so that's kind of like, that's a scenario which, you know, that's in a lot of ways a good application of the technology. It, it is. It's also a scary application because you could extrapolate that to, um, you know, understanding the structure of an individual brain, you could detect if someone was a sociopath. And, you know, maybe all serial killers are sociopath, but are all sociopath serial killers. And why don't we put everybody in a machine and find who's the sociopath? And while they're there, why don't you ask them their political affiliation too? Um, yes, and uh, I think one thing Rick brought up that is, you know, I'm, it's very clear to me that this is coming is that targeted ads are exactly one of these economies that are going to be very disruptive. I mean, there's a complete antithesis between the notion of 
um, targeted ads and the kind of future we're talking about. And if you have any doubts, you perhaps should, I mean, Kichi Matsuda's, what's the name of his wonderful dystopic AR video? There's a, there's a, a I mean, really, this is the theme of most dystopic futurist AR vid videos is the, the whole thing with the targeted ads. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's why I compare us in some ways in our future, something like's happening to Airbnb and Uber, is that these economies also have to be rethought, not just identity. I, I'm actually looking forward to the targeted ads, because I think that the advertisements that are just like washed onto everyone aren't really relevant, and they, it's just like, oh God, I, I don't want to know, like I don't, drink, I don't drink soda, so I see soda advertisements everywhere, and I'm like, oh my God, why is it so much soda? But you know, maybe there's something like, oh man, there's this new coconut water, and I'd be interested in that or whatever. So whereas my friends actually do, they don't realize they're doing it, but they're target, targeted marketing stuff to me all the time. They go, oh my god, I heard about this. Oh, what, what did you talk about the the play in New York? Sleep no more. Sleep no more. That's a targeted ad right there. He's like, oh, this is relevant to this this group of people. I I saw this thing. I like it. If if that's not a targeted ad, I don't know what it is. It's it's a good good you know, perspective on it, because the truth is, as, as fun as it is to think about how many things could go wrong, there's so many things that could go right, and we'll inevitably get it. I mean, when I was a little kid, I remember my dad told me a story that um, when they first invented trains, people thought you couldn't go faster than 30 miles an hour or you'd die, because that's how fast a, the fastest horse went, and it just nobody had a concept of going that fast, and, and it must have horrible health implications. And we kind of overcame that one, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we can do the same with augmented reality and, and neurotech. Um, we've been talking a lot about privacy, but I think that there, like the ethical questions go way beyond privacy. Um, and one of the other ones I like to really think about, because I think it's maybe even more of a concern than privacy, is uh, social stratification and applying these technologies, you know, in, in a social sense, who gets them, who gets them first, and, and how much will that change their lives relative to the other 99%. Um, that's especially relevant here in San Francisco. We've had, sort of anecdotally at least, but a couple of people report getting kicked out of bars because they're wearing Google Glass. Kind of this idea that, oh, this is a person who can afford a $1,500 gadget that goes on your face, you know, uh, and that has a camera pointed at everyone. It, there seems to be a little bit of backlash there. So how, uh, maybe Tesh, you can, you can speak to this since you were talking earlier about sort of, sort of the, 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 the poor man's uh, AR. Yeah. Uh, actually, yes. I think the frame I look at, I steal the frame from Bruce Sterling of gothic high tech and favela chic, that there's two ends to this. There's like a person you know, who can use Facebook from a favela in Brazil to kind of create a lot of you know, power in their world. And then we have, Bruce usually give the ex example of Steve Jobs in, uh, as a kind of classic gothic high tech pioneer who's in his high tower, you know, throwing down extremely high end devices to us all and there's some negotiation between that but again i i think i i always fall on the role of on the side of popularism it has more power than anything else you know there's and again that's you know with most technologies you see with the see the period we're in where it's kind of as you say niche but the minute this becomes popular everything changes and i think you know there's the power of the favela chic, which would be the, the, you know, the popular culture is huge and game-changing as much as the gothic high-tech. I think you see that an introduction of a new idea in the world is often scary to people. Uh, if you go back to the 50s and the 60s, comic books were evil, uh, 70s D&D was evil, 80s the arcade games were evil. Uh, and so I think you see eyeglasses and eyewear as being the next evil because most people haven't really been exposed to it on their daily lives. And until you kind of get that mass adoption, it will be this kind of hidden thing or kicked out of bar type thing so that once people start to experience and they talk to their friends like, this is cool, it's not evil, then you'll see it being adapted and accepted more. And I mean, you make a great point about availability. Um, because even when it's mass adopted, the first mass adoption is going to be you know, the upper class. And, and even then, it's going to take a while to trickle down. And when you talk about a technology, you know, augmented reality and, and 4D as a medium, you can already demonstrate that you can learn faster and retain more. You, know, you can blur the lines between what you know today and what you could know and, and have this, this amazing tool for knowledge transfer. And right now, it's only in the hands of a few. Um, you know, relatively speaking. But, and so while I'm really excited about head-mounted displays, I think that the mobile phone will play a really important role 
as a platform for augmented reality going forward because it's one of the best ways to get anything worldwide, you know, it, it, with as much reach as you possibly can is the mobile phone technology. I'll, I'll interject with, uh, I watched uh, Scream recently, and if you remember, there's a scene where the kid drops a cell phone out of his pocket, and the police question him, it's like, why do you have a cell phone? Kids shouldn't have cell phones. Well, that's obviously much different in today's environment, and that's the same kind of concept going forward. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, it would be uh, remiss not to talk about the other, other R at this conference, VR. Uh, yesterday we had a panel about virtual reality, and I think it would be interesting to, to hear from the panel, Rick, maybe you can lead us off on this one, about um, the over, potential overlap, I guess, between augmented reality and virtual reality and what the two can sort of borrow from one another. What, what, what's, what's common, what, what's different, and, and what, what can be shared there? I think both uh, VR and AR are, are ways to generate these worlds that just weren't possible. You know, you think about how we've interacted with computers. It's been a flat screen. It's uh, very kind of static in that regard. You can't move around in it. You can't, you can't uh, adjust into it. Uh, VR and AR are ways that we can now virtually touch into this. We can move around in these worlds. We can look up and down in all these different directions. And uh, there's this, this commonality of taking 3D content that we've all developed as authors and actually making it into a 3D world for us to experience. I think it's important to remember that they're, they're cousins as mediums. Um, they're both benefiting from the same improvements in technology. Uh, it's making it cheaper, faster, better, um, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, VR has already started to solve the latency problem at the, at the consumer scale from a price perspective, and, and that's the main thing so that you're not getting simulation sickness. And when you do, it'll take off. There'll be amazing applications for it. But, but while they're cousins as mediums, you've got to tell a story in a completely different way. Um, with VR, it's all about immersion and complete suspension of disbelief by complete immersion. Whereas with augmented reality, you're actually relying on the brain to continue to be in the real world and, and you know, interact with the anchor points that it has to establish the reality and, and adding the content or removing the content that you want selectively. Um, and your story really has to, to kind of build off of those two foundations of whether you're trying to be completely immersive and using story elements to take their attention away from places that don't have the detail you need to maintain the suspension of disbelief um, versus with the augmented reality where you're simply focusing on the storytelling elements and doing your best to anchor them in the physical world and leveraging the brain mechanics that, that, that tie you there with consciousness already. Um, I just first, quick question. How many people here have read Rainbow's End by Verna Vinge? Ah, not enough. So you will learn all you need to know about the sort Targeted of... Targeted marketing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a friend, full disclaimer. Um, if you, you know, long, a lot of people like to have this sort of like little model of, of, a, of a spectrum with VR one end and AR the other end and the full realization of them coming together, probably the most, you know, the, bo the best example of this is, well, in my book, Rainbow's End. But I think, you know, that's, that's science fiction. Where does science fiction become science fact? And I think Palmer Lucky actually really nailed it, very obviously, because he's at the heart of this, exactly how we need to go about this and how you can actually, right now, begin to bring these things together in, in very you know, practical, tra practical ways. And the key is not to go all at once after the whole Rainbow Zen vision. If you read the book, you'll realize we're a few years off that. But he kept saying, he said at least twice in his panel, he said, you know, don't keep adding features that are like a near miss, close but no cigar. But VR works if just one piece of it entirely works. And to me, like, the wheels worked in my head, right, when he said that. And that's the opportunity now that you can have, because we have now a range of hardware and, and lots of things to play with, you really can pull it off as long as you limit yourself and control yourself to that golden rule that he laid out. And I don't know, that was, that was very big for my thinking on this. You know, at the same time he said, oh, 10 years for, he said, oh, very, you know, for the, and I, I take it he's talking about the rainbow's end vision kind of thing. Yes. But this other piece, I would be very surprised not to see some very interesting things succeeding very fast.
One of the things that Palmer touched on in his, in his uh, appearance on the stage yesterday was the fact that Facebook brought in, but through the, through their acquisition of Oculus, brought in a huge amount of, of capital and of resources to get that out there. And I'm wondering if, uh, if is, is that also true of augmented reality? Is, does AR also need uh, sort of you know, a company like Google or a company like uh, you know, Facebook or, or what have you to be sort of the, the driving force here to, to uh, use the resources to, to push it out there to, to, to the world more sort of broadly? You look at me. <laughs> okay. Anyone? You, Rick, go, you, you go. You, you go, Rick. All right, I'll do uh, For any of these devices to work, there's always two components. There's the hardware, and then, then there's the software side that drives it. Hardware development is a very long and costly process. There's a lot of understanding of how a display works with the eye, and does it cause flicker, does it cause motion sickness, does it cause all these other things. Uh, research and development for lenses and things like that. Um, having obviously more capital, more foundation to develop those things allows you to come up with a better quality product, but there is also ultimately a, a scale of how much the components cost. If I buy a panel on one quantity, that's going to cost a lot more than if I buy a panel at a million quantity. And uh, obviously that's part of the play that uh, Oculus and Facebook see is that they can produce these giant quantities and help lower the consumer price and uh, ultimately increase the adoption rate. And the truth is, I mean, it's already benefiting from Google's activity with Glass. I mean, um, the, the least of which is the conversation that they've started, the trend that they've started. For the last, I've been in the augmented reality space for about 14 years. There's been maybe half a dozen head-mounted display manufacturers. Um, now, you know, a couple years ago, Google announces Glass, and every cell phone manufacturer there is has a prototype or a product they're going to bring to market. Um, you know, there's there's dozens, if not a hundred, manufacturers have head-mounted displays that are getting ready to launch some kind of product. And I think that's great for the industry. You know, in the end, what we need is is great platforms to to have these experiences in in more seamless ways and more immersive ways. I think I'll I'll chime in on one part of that is while it's great for consumers that we have all these choices, it's very difficult for us as developers when there's all these choices and if every particular product has its own set of APIs, that becomes very difficult on how do we target which products and which selections. And I think uh, looking back at when 3D cards first started to emerge to the consumers, you had OpenGL, you had OpenGL Mini Driver from 3DFX, you had the Glide. Uh, API and a few others, and as game developers, it was very hard for us to figure out which ones we should target or how much resources we, could, we should uh, spend across it. And I think that's something as we as an industry need to figure out earlier rather than later of a common API set that we can all agree with to make developers easier to, to interface. Because ultimately, it's not necessarily about the hardware, it's about the software and the experiences and consumers being able to adopt those experiences and understand how to, that there's software that's going to buy, it's going to work for my glasses, it's going to work for yours and everybody else's, at, uh, that is ultimately a win for all of us. I, I totally agree, but unfortunately it's so hard. The people who, the, the organizations that build these technologies, uh, when they first start, they're, they're so like bent on cornering every aspect of the market and they don't seem to see where the beginning and end of, of their where their product is, right? So like, like when cell phones first came out, every manufacturer had its own proprietary cable. And if you lost your cable, you couldn't just like replace the, the power cable. You had to go and buy a whole new cell phone. It didn't make sense because these, these manufacturers were kind of treating the power cable as part of their, part of their product line. Um, but it's not really where their revenue stream comes from. So it takes some time before they finally get their shit together and go like, oh, let's make this all universal connector, universal APIs so that um, one developer can write software that enables every one of our consumers to um, to make something that has utility and, and it benefits all of them, but it takes so long for them to see that every time. It's really frustrating. Um, just a quick thing of this. Um, I think also we can't separate ourselves from the problem that basically the internet has the same problem. This isn't our unique problem. If anyone saw the birth and death of JavaScript, which is a Set, the talk was given at PyCon, and it's set in 2035. And if you're kind of interested in the in the 
problems of software development for this new era of interactivity and the fact that you have to deal with all these compilers is incredibly funny, but it's incredibly sad because the basic premise is that you know Java, JavaScript, a language written in 10 days, which is JavaScript <laughs> by 2035, um, basically uh, you know becomes dominates the world until 2035 <laughs> because of this problem and. I, I mean, we're not exempt for that. This is just part of a, um, a world we're in, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what solutions emerge. You know, the real challenge is actually not going to be the developer community. It's going to be how to get the artists, the designers, and the storytellers to work in the medium. You know, you take James Cameron's not going to hack away at some code for Google Glass to make a story, but if you can give him a tool to, to tell his story in his way, then we're going to all be blown away by what he makes. Connor, look like you were going to say something. Uh, I was going to kind of, I guess, take a step back and revisit that question you asked about Facebook's acquisition of, of Oculus. Um, and I guess, like, I've been thinking about this over the last few minutes, but basically just I think it's important to, you know, um, think about driving the industry forward as a whole and, like, looking at that in some ways as a good thing, but also being responsible about... Um, how valuable this technology is going to become for humanity and also its relationship to that social stratification that we talked about early, earlier in the ethics conversation. And I think that um, it's important to identify like kind of two different types of business models. The top-down investment, which is definitely the case of Facebook acquiring Oculus, you know, like investing an immense amount of resources in developing this technology to further it, but at the same time, I don't know the answer to this question, but is it is it stretching that social rubber band? Is it stretching? Is it is it further stratifying this this field or, or just people, that humanity in general? And I think that the other end of the spectrum is is um, down up investment, which I think like I'm a huge proponent of. Which I would I would argue that Kickstarter and Indiegogo have introduced this new type of business model into the world, where people invest in something because they believe in the idea and they want it, not because they think that this amazing technology may, might be able to make their stack of money a little bit bigger, and, and yeah, they kind of believe in it. But I don't think there's any venture capitalist will in, that will invest in something or, or a large company that will acquire something if it's not a good business decision as well. So I think it's just important, you know, I don't really have an answer to what I'm saying, but just it's important to highlight the difference in the two different business models and, and noting the importance that there is value in the bottom-up investment as well. Very yeah. good point. I think we have a microphone around here. Maybe time for a couple questions from the audience. See one here. Do we have an extra microphone? Here in the front. Hello. Hello, I'm Dr. Susan Jewell from the International Space Surgery Consortium. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. It's a very interesting discourse and discussion. Um, my question really is, I'm very interested in the concept of the Internet of the Soul. And, uh, and the who. And so I would like you to expand, and this is open to everybody in the panel, um, the idea and also the evolution and maybe one day the full integration of augmented um, empathy, artificial empathy. I suppose because I brought that up. Ah! <laughs> um, but I think this is, I'll tell you where my thinking now Tim Chang has done a lot of writing on this aspirational self that's very key. And, you know, he was here yesterday. He's an investor in Luminosity. And very, I mean, so you can look that up after. But where I come from on this is, well, as an example, I was listening to um, Kelly, Kelly McGonigal, Jay McGonigal's sister's TED Talk on this research done about stress and that, in fact, people... Stress isn't in itself bad, according to this study. It's the way people narrativize it to their self. So the people who think stress is bad for them get all of this poor heart problems and all of these other things. And people whose narrative, you can question the study, but who knows, but don't have much better results with stress, and it actually can enhance their health. And I think that, you know, it's this internet of the soul probably does, and we talked, it came up a little on the VC panel, is it gets into sort of 2,000 year old stuff and touchy feely stuff that we don't really think about in the tech community. But, you know, these ideas that, you know, that mind has that sort of controlling factor in terms of just the very concept on the concept level is pretty powerful. And I think, I mean, that's the, what I think about 
you know, some of the devices I've seen here, their real superpower is really going to be that when they can help us actually work with these internal narratives that we have that are super powerful and perhaps more powerful than the current metrics we get when we go to a doctor, which I find really very unhelpful usually. They usually don't reflect the true picture, like, you know, what's your cholesterol, what's your um, blood pressure, what's your heart rate, what's all of these sort of, you know, very um, biologically based thinking. And I think that's the opportunity for everyone who's in the health industry with some of these devices, is that you don't need FDA approval to really change people's health because the FDA isn't even looking at what really changes people's health. And so that's what I think of when I think of the internet of the soul, is that, and I don't know, I, I mean, people have been coming out as meditators all over the last two days, so I'll come out as a meditator. So I have a lot of opinions about that. And in my own experience, you know, this is, I would agree with the ancient tradition, mind rules, and mind is not in a box. And the, in, the question of an individual is definitely up for debate. What is an individual? What is mind? So that's, that's where I come from. But I think you'd be super practical. I saw so many startups here that sort of are getting that. And I think there's going to be a revolution in how we think of health, body. I mean, this is the oldest debate in the Western philosophy, body, mind. But now we've got this stuff that's going to get in the hands of people so they can you know, they can put on Muse and they can see that negative thoughts make their stress thing go do 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 <laughs> And I mean, it's just a beginning because it's this is where Brian speaks to it. It's, it is about new narrative tools too because we do not really have tools to experience this, this level. Authentic empathy. Thank you so much um, for that. That's really interesting to hear. But I really also like to hear from anyone in the panel about augmented um, empathy or artificial empathy, because that's kind of like the next stage or the next level down from or up from uh, artificial intelligence. I think that artificial empathy is not far off. I, I, I think that with the type of analytics we have available, even like we've been picking on Google this whole time. Um, but Google, I think, has the same kind of data analytics that you could use to derive empathy. So when they look at people's search histories and how they interact and um, with, with the internet and in the future when we have devices that track how we interact with each other and our mood especially, that's uh, going to be a key component. I think that that type of analytics will allow us to see a person's uh, behavioral history and how it correlates with their mood and, and through that coupled with research um, that lets us understand how those behaviors and those moods correlate and how people respond. We'll have a very clear understanding of what people's motivations are. And I think mood, behavior, and motivation are really the key components of understanding, of creating empathy. And um, I think that, yeah, so I think that computerized empathy is not really a long way off. And I think it's going to be a very interesting um, and transformative uh, uh, development. Kind of last word, then we're at time. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd like to touch on this as well. The, just the, the idea that uh, I, I think empathy is, is when you, uh, when something elicits an emotional response, so, so mood. So it's, it's all based on these, these stories and these narratives that we've built up in our head. And, and I mean, it's deep rooted in our brain uh, to, to, the, like, to the core of what makes us similar to other animals. Um, but we have this much more abstract, uh, I guess, process of understanding empathy but I think what's what's really interesting to note is that uh, computers aren't random and humans are so we have this no matter how far or how deep you dig into a human it's gonna be ran there's there's something deeper you know and um, and so with empathy it's I think the trick or the way that we're going to uh, simulate it or, or is going to be through recording people and data about people and emotional responses and immense amounts of data and looking at these statistics, look, looking at all of this data and people's emotional responses to real world experiences and then trying to break down these statistical models and then remap them into an algorithm. Um, and so it will still, it will be the illusion of empathy, but it will be very difficult to actually create empathy. So. Can I right, end with an invite, Eric? Can I end with an, I'd just like to, because I haven't 
being able to talk about entertainment because we're under the radar. But I would like to invite everyone in this room to sign up for our beta list, and you can go to the website, syntertainment.com, and it would be nice. Hopefully, you'll, we'll, you'll see you there sometime in the near future. And empathy is about connectivity. It's about understanding that we are connected. So hope to connect with many of you soon. <laughs> All right, well, now let's pass the torch on to the uh, next next panel here, and uh, let's thank this panel for, for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.